Hi, everyone. Today I want to talk about the essence of religion. What is it? It is experiencing God. Experiencing the presence of God. Christ introduced something into religion, if I, if I want to use that term, if we use that term, that had never been there before. He called God his heavenly Father, and he taught us to pray, our heavenly Father. God is our heavenly Father. And to know him, is, to know God doesn't mean to know this theological doctrine or that scripture verse or to know his attributes or to be able to list this or that. It's to experience him. To actually know, know him as your father. To experience the presence of God. Now, we know that such a thing must be possible and it must be uh, it must be something wonderful because correct me if I'm wrong, but whenever we see a reconciliation, especially like on YouTube, maybe once in a while they have a video of a father maybe who has been away in the service. He's been overseas. He may even have been in, in a conflict zone. And the family hasn't seen him for many months. And then somehow he comes back, and sometimes it's a surprise. I remember one where the daughter was, see, it almost makes me want to cry just sitting here thinking about it. She was on her high school basketball team. And suddenly her father entered the auditorium and she saw her father. It was just so beautiful. So we know in our hearts that such a thing is possible. And we know that it's wonderful. And that's what you need to experience a reconciliation with your heavenly Father. It's that simple. And I know you've got a lot of stuff on Christian radio and Christian television. You have a lot of universities with theology departments, and you got all that stuff. But if it doesn't somehow help you to get closer to God, so that you experience him, so that you are united, reconciled with your heavenly Father, then it doesn't really do much good. As a matter of fact, there's a danger that it might stand in the way. Now let's talk about this reconciliation. In fact, Christ said, this is eternal life, that they know you. He's, he was speaking to God that they know you. Okay, so what stands in the way? Well, pride or stubbornness. See, we inherit a nature that came to us by way of our parents all the way back to Adam and Eve, and it's a little bit prideful and uh, a little bit stubborn, a little bit willful. So that interferes. Now, it's not an insurmountable barrier, but it is for most people. But it, it, it doesn't have to be at all. The only thing that's needed is at some point in your life, usually after a lot of suffering, because suffering softens your soul. And after a lot of suffering, you uh, 
you're ready. And after having tasted the, the, the delights of the world. See, when we're little kids, we love ice cream and pizza, and we love to run and frolic, and we love to play with our puppy and with our cat, and we love our friends, and we love our bicycle, and we, we love all of these wonderful things, and God wants it that way. He wants us to taste of the delights of his, of the great, wonderful world and universe that he has made. But as we get older, as we get to be 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, then we, the pro, we continue to seek fulfillment in those experiences, and that's the mistake. We have to begin to be able to let them go. And letting them go, we pick up the spiritual life. We let go of the earthy, earthly life and pick up the spiritual life. Now, it's only, see, since the, the earthy life, the sensuous life, the emotional life, the life of pride and of ego and of striving and struggling and getting over on him and he gets over on you and you get revenge on her and she, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, that's, but that's all we know. You know, and yelling and screaming at ball games and indulging ourselves. So that's all we know. But we we sense that there's something more. Now, since it's all we know, we couldn't lay it down. We couldn't possibly lay it down without grace. God makes it possible. And how does he make it possible? Because he, be ever so gently, introduced introduces us to another life. And how does it begin? So then we pick up the one and we let go of the, of the other. And he helps with that. But how does it begin? I said that, that pride, stubbornness, willfulness get in the way. We don't want to see. We naturally see as we are, no matter how many degrees we have, no matter how nice we act, no matter how much money we give to the poor, see, no matter how nice people say we are, and so on and so forth, we are prideful. We don't want to admit we're wrong. We resent seeing our own flaws. We have certain things that we, that we want that we don't want to let go of. We want, we want people to like us, or we want to have a happy home, or we, we want worldly security, or we want to get something that somebody else ha has. And we, we, we were jealous of them for having it. So all these things we want. So we, all these things, that's the way we are naturally. So how do we overcome that? Well, it happens when God, when you're ready, and then God turns up the light a little bit, turns up the dimmer switch on the light, so that you see your own wrong. You see that you hated your mom. You resented your dad. Yeah, you hated your brother. Maybe with good reason. Maybe he was cruel or mean or he pushed you around or lied about you or spread. You see, who knows what he did, but whatever it was, yes, yeah, so you have reason for it. But nevertheless, hating and resenting is, um, is wrong. And hating your parents, especially hating our parents. Our parents, they did the best they could, but they messed up. And they failed you. And so you resented him for that, especially your dad. He failed you. You needed your dad to be stronger than the world. You needed something special from him. And he did the best he could, but he somehow didn't have it. And that's why your mom resented him. See, that she, she was angry at your dad too, wasn't she? See, she was, then she was guilty, so that she, she went overboard to be nice, but then that only made him more spoiled. And that's the whole story. I've written about it in, in my books especially the myths and mysteries of marriage. You should really get that book. But I want to talk about that now.
What I want to talk about now is the fact that you, you, you're born with this fallen nature, and you're a little bit selfish, a little bit prideful, and a little bit angry, and maybe with good reason you're angry, and maybe good, with good reason you form judgments of people. But see, all of that stands in the way of getting to know your heavenly Father. And so, at some point, though, you begin to, your soul softens. You begin to see that you're just like your mom. You resented her, and now you're just like her. Or you resented your dad, and you're just like him. See? Or you resented your dad, and you married a man like your dad. And yeah, you hated him, and you raged, and you tried to change him, and you tried, you got angry at him, and you tried to motivate him, and you tried all these things, and it didn't help, and it just made it worse. But all of a sudden, one day, you see that he's just a man. And you, you, you see that you hate him and you feel sorry, you regret it. That's the beginning. See, the opposite of pride is uh, shame, if you will. Yeah, shame. See, the devil wants you to think. The devil doesn't like shame. He, he wants you to, to shy away from shame, but I say shame is sweet. When that in which you are being ashamed in front of is honorable, have you ever known a person who was really a good person and you did them wrong somehow? And they, they found out you did them wrong and they didn't hate you? It made you feel so bad because of their kindness and their graciousness. You see what I mean? So if you if you suddenly realize that you hated your mom or your dad and you're sorry, you're sorry, and you're really sorry, and that is the moment where God is touching you with his light and making you aware of your own wrong, but he's so good and gracious and kind. He doesn't hate you. In his presence, you simply see you're wrong and you regret what you see. That's the beginning of it. It's so small. It's so simple. It's so profound. The greatest day of your life is the day that you suddenly realize that you hated your mom or you hated your dad or you're, you're hating other people and judging them and you're sorry. And you see it in God's light and you don't try to escape it. You don't try to run from the light. You don't reach for your phone. You don't reach for, you know, a drink or a cigarette or food or work, anything. You just, you just are with that regret, what you see about yourself. And you don't resent it. See, resent, resentment is rejecting the truth. If you see that you're wrong, and then you reject it, you resent it, you resent seeing it, see, then all that does is reinvigorate pride again to come to your defense. So I think I've made, I've tried to keep it as simple as I can. It's to experience the presence of God. Now, there have been some people who have, and they've tried to write about it and tell you about it. And it's people like um, Christ did. See, he's the first one. He told us about the Heavenly Father. And he was very it, it, he was very much acquainted. He knew his father. He was intimately acquainted with his Heavenly Father. And then down through history, people, and I always come back to people like Madame Guillon and uh, François Fénelon 
and uh, Miguel Molinos, people like that. St. Francis de Sales, St. John of the Cross, Thomas Akempis, and who among modern um, people, who told us to experience, who, who told us that the essence of religion is to experience the presence of God? You know who? A.W. Tozer. A lot of people love A.W. Tozer. He's very well regarded. He's not controversial. He's uh, well thought of among Protestant evangelicals and so on. A.W. Tozer. As a matter of fact, let me read, read you what A.W. Tozer had to say. I'm looking forward here. Here it is. A.W. Tozer. He said, In this hour of all but universal darkness, one cheering gleam appears within the fold of conservative Christianity. There are to be found increasing numbers of persons whose religious lives are marked by a growing hunger after God himself. They are eager for spiritual realities and will not be put off with words, nor will they be content with correct interpretations of truth. They are a thirst for God, and they will not be satisfied till they have drunk deep at the fountain of living waters. That's A.W. Tozer. That's from his The Pursuit of God, very famous book. So I will leave you with those words. So how do we, how do we begin? You, if you are one of those destined to find your father, you already are yearning. You're seeking for answers, and you're not saying it. You, some, some people have gone everywhere. They've gone to every church, every different spiritual practice, every type of everything. They've tried it all, and they're still looking. They are seeking. seeking. Christ said, seek, and you will find. So that's what you can do. You can seek, and you can yearn, and when you realize your own wrong, you can see it and not resent it, and you can cry out to your Creator silently, wordlessly. The cry of the soul is silent and without words. Cry out to your Creator. And in his time and place, in due time, he will answer. If he doesn't answer right away, don't resent it. Don't resent God. Just go about your life. Do what you can. And like I said on my radio program last week, if you see yourself messing, if you're messing up, then just see yourself messing up and say, Lord, if anybody's going to help me, it's got to be you. And with that kind of an attitude, God will answer. All right? So. I'm going to stop at, at that point. Oh, resources. Yeah, I got to, got to leave you with some resources. I am not the answer. The answer is God. Finding him, that's, the, that's it. Finding him. Experiencing his presence. There you go. Well, my little meditation is helpful my little sitting quietly exercise is helpful because now you're too lost in your thoughts. So you're not going to find God in your thoughts, your imaginings, your vain imaginings, or in your worries or in your plans and your schemes. You're not going to find him in study. 
You're not going to find him in the book? See? And we all know that emotions tend to kind of interfere, don't they? When you get angry, see, it's not helpful at all. When you're resentful, it's not helpful. When you're bitter, it's not helpful. See, any of those emotions are not helpful. And somehow there's a connection between thoughts, especially negative ones, and these negative emotions. So somehow you have to stand, learn how to stand back from them. So that they're still there, but your soul is above them. It's like coming up to the surface of the water. You know, if you were underneath the water, then you come up to the surface of the water and you break through the water and there's the blue sky and the sunlight and the birds sing, singing and flying overhead and a breath of fresh air. So you have to come up above the surface of all of that stuff going on down there. So it's still there, but you what? You observe it. You're not a part of it. You're not lost in it. You're not submerged in it. See? So the, the meditation is so helpful with that, or the little sitting quietly exercise. Those are very helpful. And the reading resources can be helpful if you read them in the right way. For example, A Guide to True Peace. It's a very nice book. A Guide to True Peace, a spiritual classic, is a collection of some of the writings of Madame Rion, François Fénelon, and Miguel Molinos together. See, these people wanted us to be... See, God said, see, God told us, didn't he, in the Old Testament? He said, be still and know that I am God. And these writers, they found that. And, and they're just trying to put it in words so that maybe reading their words, you'll say, oh, I see, I get it. But when you read it, don't try to absorb it and get lost in it. Read it lightly, like scanning. Read it lightly until, you, until something is highlighted for you, some thought. And it's beautiful, or it's profound, or it's meaningful for you. Oh, it's like a relief. You see, see, you actually see the truth of it. And then you close the book and you go about your life. But you still have that delicate thought in your mind, maybe during the day, and then you'll maybe see see it again and again, and you'll realize. And, and so that's the way to read. I think that's what they used to call it, uh, Le Lectio Divina or something like that, where some of the, the, um, the uh, saints would, would tell us to read a little bit of scripture, perhaps, or some spiritual word, read a little bit, and then meditate, would, and then meditate on. They would use that term. But actually, it's just, well, I think what they had in mind is to read a little, a little something and, until you realize something, until you see something profound, and then that's enough. Then ha have that one little thought, but don't even try to hang on to it. It'll come back. During the day, it'll come back. You'll see it again. But don't try to hang on to it. Just let it go. And then go about your life when it's appropriate or when God wants you to, to see it again, then you'll see it again. Next time, even more, pro, even more deeply than this time. So it's a process of letting go, of coming to God and finding the spiritual walk. It's a process of, of letting go something that used to be such a burden. Now, it's not a burden anymore. Things that used to upset you now, they don't upset you anymore. See? And we know some of that, even just maturing, growing up, getting older, becoming a grandma or grandpa. See, we, we understand, don't sweat the small stuff. When we're young, we sweat the small stuff. 
when you get older, you learn not to sweat the small stuff. Well, it's it's like that, except even more profound. But along the way, as you let go of all these things, in, in its place comes to spiritual life from God. And it's his life. He gives it to you. And it's always like a surprise. You don't plan anything. It's like a delight. It's like a a joy. You weren't expecting it. Oh, is that wonderful? God loves to give people gifts. If you demand it, then you won't get it. If you try to give it to yourself, how many times have you wanted something and you and finally and you know you should wait, but finally you you give in and you buy it for yourself, and then the next day there it is. You could have if somebody gave gives it to you, or you could have had it for free, or it was on sale. But then you have to see your own, well, your own selfishness, see, and impatience. So it, it's something like that. It comes as a surprise when you least expect it. Oh, it's a delight. So can you see? Now it's also becoming more like a child again. See, there you have it again. Your heavenly father is good. He gives you gifts. And uh, you're like a child and you're delighted to receive them. <laughs>